Everyone has their own story. Some people's stories are happier than others. I had always had a pretty basic life. Other than my parents splitting up when I was 10, nothing really sad had ever happened to me. I had lost my grandparents, but they were old, and I understood that it was natural and part of life. When it comes to tragedy, that was something I had never experienced. When I saw sad things happen to people in movies or heard about it on the news, I felt bad, but that was it. I really didn't get what it meant to be grieving or to sustain a big loss, a loss that sticks with you for your whole life. I had hoped I would never find out. I always thought, you never know what people have gone through or are going through, so be kind, be patient. When someone was driving super slow in front of me, or when someone made a mistake on the road or hesitated at a red light, I never honked or swore. I always thought, maybe that person just got the worst news of their lives. Maybe that person just lost someone they loved. I knew people suffered and had sad stories, but until I had my own, I didn't get a lot of things. I had always wanted to be a writer, and the number one piece of advice aspiring writers always get is, write what you know. I went to university and studied English. One thing I noticed quickly about the great writers was that most of them had suffered. Most of them had very interesting stories of their own. And it seemed like those struggles and challenges gave them a depth that made them and their writing more interesting and unique. I didn't necessarily want to experience tragedy, but I felt like I was lacking life experience. After all, I had never had a broken heart and I had never lost someone shockingly and unexpectedly. I completed my English degree and got a job as an editor at a publishing firm. I read other people's work and made suggestions, checked their grammar and spelling, and the flow of their writing. After three years of reading and critiquing the work of others, I started to wonder if I had what it takes to become a writer. I also was wanting a change and something more fulfilling. I had journaled since I was a little girl, and I loved how writing made me feel. I still doubted myself, though. What would I write about? What interesting story did I have to tell? Meanwhile, I had started dating my future husband. He was a solid guy, reliable provider, was healthy, and seemed to love me. Looking back, I realized I never loved him the way I should. But I wanted to start my life. And most of all, I wanted to have a baby. I wanted to be a mom. We got married in a small ceremony with just our parents present. I didn't even want to have a wedding. Being the center of attention was not my thing. When I refused to have a bridal shower, my mother-in-law was less than thrilled. I remember saying, this is just all starting to really not feel like me. She apologized and that was that. No bridal shower, thank goodness. I had asked my fiancé if we could just head down to City Hall and tie the knot with just the two of us. He liked the idea, especially the part of saving the money and not having a wedding. But his parents whispered in his ear, and we compromised on a small reception after our tiny private ceremony. I had already told him I wanted to start a family right away, and truthfully, I was hoping I'd come back from the honeymoon with a bun in the oven. We had rented a cottage on one of the Gulf Islands and had a blissful two weeks there. We drove there straight from the reception and I couldn't have been happier. I do remember feeling like things were slightly off and my new husband was trying his best to be romantic, but he just wasn't natural at it. Let's face it, there's a lot of pressure to have the perfect wedding followed by the perfect honeymoon. We tried to make a baby, but I came home from the trip with only fond memories. A couple months later, after trying and trying, I suspected I was pregnant. Just the thought of it filled me with fear and wonder. I felt like my story was about to start and hoped the life experience would inspire my writing and give me a deeper understanding of human emotions, the kind that good writers and artists seem to have. Fast forward nine months to the birth of my first child, Duncan. He was everything I had hoped for, he was healthy and adorable. I couldn't take my eyes off him. I'll never forget that first night in the hospital. He had cuddled up in the crook of my arm, 
and although I had been in labor for more than 25 hours and was beyond exhausted, I couldn't close my eyes long enough to fall asleep. I couldn't take them off his sleeping tiny face. Now I really understood what love felt like. I loved my husband, but that depth of emotion wasn't there. And when I saw the faces of my children, I knew I would always put them above everyone and everything. I wondered if it would be a problem in my marriage. Two years later, our second son, Kenneth, was born. Now I was really busy. I was beyond exhausted, but loved being a mom, just as I knew I would. The one thing I felt was missing was having a daughter. I hated to admit it, but once we had our two boys and had decided our family was done, I felt a sadness at the thought of never having a daughter. When I found out I was pregnant again unexpectedly, three years after the birth of our second son, I was crushed. I couldn't have three boys. There were a lot of boys in my husband's family, and we both felt sure number three would be a boy as well. I allowed myself two weeks to wallow, and then told myself to buck up and that I would love my third child just as I had loved the first two. I told myself that I was tougher than I thought and would handle it because that's what mothers did and had to do. At five months, we went for an ultrasound. And while my husband did not want to find out the sex, I did. When the ultrasound technician said, it's not 100%, but if I was a betting man, I would bet that's a girl you've got in there. Everything made sense. I had gotten my girl. Four months later, I had pushed out a screaming ginger-haired lass that made my heart burst every time I looked at her. She was a fiery little girl and lived up to that stereotype of the feisty redhead. She had a temper, and when she fought with her brothers, she would let loose screams that sounded like a cat being tortured. As she grew up, her personality changed and became more sedate. As a tween, I started to worry about her. She seemed down, not herself. We did everything we could and we had a close relationship. I still felt like I wasn't really understanding her or like I was missing something. At 16, she was diagnosed with depression and we made the difficult decision to put her on antidepressants. It was such a hard choice to have to make and she seemed so young to be medicated. But after trying everything else, we followed the advice of our doctor and took the plunge. It took a few months on the pills, but she seemed happier. She had never had a lot of friends, but the friends she did have were good ones. They were close and looked out for one another. I got a lot of comfort from that. We were told that the goal of antidepressants was for them to help for a time, but then to get off them. After two years, we started to worry she was addicted. We had tried to wean her off them, but she became a different person, a scary person. Her sadness seemed to know no depths, and I tried to understand the way she saw the world. I read endless books and went to endless talks about the teenage brain and how, as a mom, you can help them through those difficult years. I woke up on an average Tuesday, shortly after we were trying her off the drugs again, and went to work. I was still editing, but felt like there was a worthy story brewing inside me. I felt like it was tied to my daughter, to her struggles, and to my struggles as a mom parenting a child with depression. That day I had finished early and driven home from work to find the front door unlocked. That surprised me as at that time, there shouldn't have been anyone else at home. It instantly put me on edge and gave me the chills. I called out, hello, anyone home? I brushed the thought of a burglar aside and headed up the stairs. When I saw my daughter's door slightly open, I pushed it open all the way. What I saw changed me forever. She was lying on the floor with blue lips and was clearly dead. I flew at her, shook her, yelled, cried, screamed, howled. I called 911 and frantically looked around for a clue to what happened. My eyes fell on an envelope peeking out from under the bed. I opened the envelope, read what was inside, and what it said shocked me to my core.